you put your hands together and give the Lord praise and thank him. Oh, we love you, Lord. We magnify your name. Would you stand to your feet today if you're physically able for the word of the Lord today? I'm not going to preach to you long today, but I have a word for you from the Lord. I, I felt prompted to bring this word to you today. And I don't know, I don't know who it's for today, but whoever it may be, the Lord knows exactly who it is today. And I just want to be a voice for him today. Allow him to minister to you. I'm going to preach to you something that I've had to learn and I'm going to preach to you something that I found myself searching for and had to receive in my life because it brought me through. There's times in your life to where you need something just more than a worship service to take you through. You agree? That there's going to be times in your life to when you need something more than just a church service to bring you through. And I want to preach you today what it is you need to bring you through. I won't preach to you long, but I have a word today. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Thank you, Oda Grady, for being led of the Holy Ghost. Everything that has been done today has been in the perfect will of God. Acts chapter 9, I have a lengthy portion of scriptures. Bear with me. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to verse 22. It's important for us to read this whole text today. Acts chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. If you're ready, shout amen. amen. The word of the Lord says, and Saul, everyone shout Saul, Saul. who many of you know today as Paul. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And the Bible goes on to say that he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And the Bible says, Then Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus for behold he prayeth and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight then Ananias answered Lord I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem and here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name the name of the Lord Jesus but the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, in spite of all of that, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in thy way as thou camest and hast sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately the Bible says there fell from his eyes that had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. 
that he is the son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the one that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. I want you to look again in verse 3 where the Bible says in Acts chapter 9, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly... There shined round about him a light from heaven. He received an encounter. He received an encounter. He received an encounter that changed him. He received an experience that changed him. And by the help of the Lord, for the next 20 minutes, I want to preach to you on this thought, the Damascus experience. The Damascus experience. Would you lay your Bibles down today? Would you raise your hands and in the presence of the Lord that is here this hour? Would you pray that God would touch our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and anoint us to receive the word of God this very moment, Lord Jesus? I come before you this hour in the name of Almighty God. And Lord, I come today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For Lord, you've given me a word for more than just one in this house. And Lord, I pray that you would use my voice. I pray that you would use my mind. I pray that you would use my lips of clay. Quicken me, God, to bring forth the word of God. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would use every man and woman in this house. Anoint their minds, their hearts, their spirits, and their ears to receive the word of God. And God, may we move in that dimension of the Holy Ghost that you'd have us to move in through the preaching of the word of God. Amen. I ask it now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you for what you're going to do this very moment. For Lord, I know it's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. I thank you for your help. For in my weakness, God, make me strong. In my frailty, God, make me strong. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask it now in Jesus' name. And everyone shout amen. Would you put your hands together again before you're seated and give God praise. Hallelujah. Everyone shout the Damascus experience. Shout it again, the Damascus experience. To paint a full portrait of Paul requires a large canvas indeed, which at last we are not able to provide for such a saintly adventurer for the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is there with gifts sufficient to perfectly Deliate this magnificent personality whose conversion was violent and dramatic, his roving life full of action and danger, and whose achievement was to transform Christianity from a small Hebrew sect into a world religion. We have more biographical matter on Paul than any other New Testament personality except our Lord Jesus Christ, of course. How he seems to dominate the book of Acts. As for his own priceless letters, they are likewise well documented with glimpses of his trials and triumphs, his many crises and quick decisions and narrow escapes and sporadic outbursts of violence make his career one of the greatest adventure stories of all time. Do you often wonder what this remarkable first Christian theologian was actually like? Although artists have tried to depict him, no contemporary portrait of Paul survives. However, uh, Osler in the greatest faith ever known has given us this unique picture of the apostle extraordinary. He goes on to say that he was not more than three cubits tall. And since a cubit was a foot and a half of our measuring, we find that Paul who breathed forth fire and slaughter was less than five feet tall. But he was broad shouldered early athletic victories had hardened his well-conditioned body and he was sinewy and gracefully in spite of his prematurely balding head and the early gray that encroached on the close-knit eyebrows and thick beard in this 30th year. Yet it was not his stalwart figure nor his fair complexion nor the decision suggested by the long nose, not yet his impelling manner that held the crowd at synagogue silent. What transformed Paul, bespelling his hearers, was his fire of faith and zeal that flashed and flared in those enormous eyes that were like drop windows in a human furnace. He who often conceded that his stature was not impressive stood in the Damascus synagogue and impressed everyone within the sound of his voice beginning their a ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ that was to last 39 years. 
As to his physical appearance, we are not left without means of knowing it fairly well. It was not a pre-positioning and neither attractive nor dignified. Uh, however, it was a small man, feeble, plain, nearsighted, and early in life, bald-headed. An account in the apocryphal second century Acts of, of Paul says that he was a man of little stature, partly bald, with crooked legs, a vigorous physique, and with eyes set so close together and nose somewhat hooked. And his enemy said that his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. And we find that Paul said of himself in the word of God, I wish or I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Rude in speech, without were fightings, within were fears. Through the infirmity of the flesh, I preached the gospel. If I had been possible yet, would I have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me? I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice. And all of these features indicate that the apostle had a frail body which groaned under the demands made upon it and barely able to meet them. And yet the fire of zeal glowed and burned in his feeble frame and consumed him with its fervor. And how God magnified his grace and power by placing such a treasure in cracked yet clean earthen vessel. Paul may not have been the best looking guy around. Paul may have had crooked legs and Paul may have had a balding head and Paul may have had a pointed nose and Paul may not have talked properly and Paul may have been short in physical stature but yet he stands tall in his faith and he stands tall in his confidence and he stands tall in his trust and he stands tall in his belief and love and assurance in a God whom he served. We find in the word of God that Paul was mightily used of God. We find in the word of God that Paul was anointed of the Holy Ghost. And we find in the word of God that Paul was chosen for that day and hour like none other. We find in the word of God that Paul brought about the demonstration and the power of the Holy Ghost in the lives of those around him. We find in the word of God that Paul was the leading factor in a great revival sweeping across all of Asia in a space of just a few years. Paul pulled in the poles of his ancient world and bound them to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and from Italy to Syria he blazed the trail for the Lord Jesus Christ in Macedonia and Thrace and Greece and Asia Minor and Galatia and Pontus and Cappadocia and Cilicia and Syria and Cyprus. He threw open to the Gentiles the doors of the church and bade them to come in. We understand and know that he wrote with frenzied pen. His letters are now all Bible books and wellsprings of doctrine and the scaffolding of a church theology Peter's spirit, rather, Peter's spirit may be the church's rock. However, Paul's writings are the superstructure, the side walls, and the roof. Self-sacrifice was his life's law, and Calvary its passion. Paul was courageous as he was faithful, as indifference to criticism, as he was stubborn for righteousness. He is one of truth dominant heroes. Christianity's noblest martyrs, the New Testament Moses and the pivotal portrait in the gallery of the soldiers of the cross. We find that he lived. We find that he breathed. We find that he slept. We find that he ate the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me stop right here and say this today. It is the will of God for every man and every woman and every young person and every saint of God to display those same attributes as Paul. It is the will of God for us to live and to breathe and to sleep and to eat the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. For I have been chosen in the day and hour that I am living in. And let me stop right here and say this. Under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, you've been chosen for the day and hour that you are living in. There is a purpose for you in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter what you may look like. It doesn't matter how bad shape you may have found yourself in in the future. When you get a hold of God and God gives you an experience and God fills you full of the Holy Ghost and you get a hold of the Holy Ghost and God saturates his power on you. He'll use you in a way you've never been used before and you'll do great exploits in the kingdom of God in the day and hour that we are living in. Oh, if you believe that, clap your hands and give God praise. 
I believe that we are living in a day and hour where the church ought to do great exploits in the kingdom of God. I believe that we are living in a day and hour where signs and wonders ought to be the norm. I believe we're living in a day and an hour where apostolic ministry and apostolic power and apostolic anointing ought to be the norm. Some will tell you that the world don't need that today, but honey, I come to differ with you. This world needs apostolic ministry. This world needs apostolic power. And this world needs apostolic anointing. And it needs signs and demonstrations in the day and hour that we are living in. I've come to tell you today that the devil is busy. I've come to tell you today that hell is busy. I've come to tell you today that hell is using every tool. I've come to tell you today that Lucifer is using every tool. And it's not time for the people of God to sit idly by and sit on the premises and let the devil and all of hell do anything and everything it wants to do. It's time for the church of the living God to stand up and take the rightful place and say, I am going to come against the attack of the enemy. And I am going to come against the the very gates of hell and I am going to do great exploits in the day and hour that I am living in I've come to tell every young person you can do great exploits I've come to tell every man you can do great exploits I've come to tell every woman you can do great exploits you have the power of the Holy Ghost on the inside of you There was never such a man so dedicated to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was never such a man so committed to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was never such a man so consumed by the agenda and purpose and plan of the kingdom of God. Every waking hour he had to preach the gospel. Every waking hour he had to minister to the needs of those around him. Every waking hour he had to reach the lost and dying. Every waking hour he had to minister to those in need of a savior that could change their life forever. Every waking hour he had to show someone the gospel of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we find that his ministry was blessed and we find that his ministry was anointed of God and we find that he lived and moved in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost and we find that the supernatural touch of God was upon his life and we find that under his ministry literally hundreds of thousands if not millions were coming to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and we find that disease and sickness and devils and spirits would bow at his command. The miraculous was transpiring all around him but most importantly we also find that he was willing to give his very life for the things he once had tried to erase. Time after time he faced risks and disasters and storms and water and robbers. He, he was in danger, the Bible says, of his own countrymen and from heathen in the city and in the wilderness and even among false brethren. The Bible tells us and we find in the word of God that five times he was beaten with 40 stripes, save one. You thought you had a rough, listen to Paul. You thought your life is messed up, listen to Paul. You thought you've gone through trouble in your life, listen to Paul. He says five times I was beaten 40 stripes, save one. Three times he was beaten with rods. On three occasions he was shipwrecked. On journeys of every conceivable means, he felt the effects of physical awareness and pain and hunger and thirst and cold and nakedness. And books could be written to describe the terriblenessness of his sufferings. However, we find that perils of nature did not daunt him and shipwrecks did not discourage him. I feel the Holy Ghost. We find that beatings did not detour him and disasters and storms and water and robbers did not stop him. And the effects of weariness and pain and hunger and thirst and cold and nakedness uh, did not impede his progress. Uh, what caused him to go where others would not have gone? Uh, what caused him to do what others would not have done? Uh, what caused him to sustain uh, what others would not have sustained? Uh, what caused him to get beyond the sufferings in his life uh, where others uh, would have resigned themselves to the fact of what was going on uh, and pulled out the white flag and called it quits? Uh, I'll tell you what it was. Uh, it was an experience many years before on the road to Damascus uh, that sustained him uh, and kept him uh, and brought him through. 
Something happened on that road that changed him forever. Something happened on that road that changed how he approached things. Something happened on that road that changed his outlook on things. Something happened on that road that day that changed his thinking. Something happened on that road that day that caused him to see differently than he had ever seen before. On that road to Damascus, the very God of the universe gave him a revelation of who he really was. This revelation did not come from some prophet. This revelation did not come from some scribe. This revelation did not come from some gathering in the synagogue somewhere. This revelation did not come at the feet of Gamaliel. He had a revelation. He had an experience. He had an encounter with Almighty God for himself. And I'm glad to tell you today that the revelation I have and the, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. The revelation that I have and the experience that I have didn't come from my granddaddy, didn't come from my grandmother, didn't come from my mama or daddy. It came from God himself. I've come to declare to you, I don't have just a religion. I've got an encounter. I don't have just a religion. I've got an encounter of the changing kind. And I've come to tell you that when you see who he really is and you understand who he really is. It'll change everything about you. It'll change your heart. It'll change your mind. It'll change your spirit. You see, that's the problem with the church today. All they have is just a feel-good service. My God, I'm going to preach. I ain't going to preach long, but I'm going to preach to you whether you want me to or not. You know what the problem is today? People think they can get by by just shaking the preacher's hand. People think they can fight sin in their life just by declaring it, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, honey. It goes far more than that. I got to find myself in an apostolic church and walk down an apostolic aisle and stand at an apostolic altar and let the Holy Ghost fill me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet and give me a revelation and an understanding of who he really is. Shout, I believe, it. I believe it. There have been many defining moments in the life of human beings that changed their lives forever. These defining moments often set the course for the balance of their life. For Moses, it was what? You know it, shout the burning bush. For Peter, it was walking on the water. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was what? Not only the fiery furnace, but walking through the fiery furnace. You see, some people believe that God can get you to it, but that God will never bring you through it. Some of you have enough faith saying, God, I believe you'll get me to it, but God, I really don't think you have enough power to get me through this. Honey, what kind of God is it that you serve? If God will take me to it, then God will bring me through it. And it was through that fiery furnace experience. They knew of Jehovah. They heard of Jehovah. They understood who they thought Jehovah really was. But it was through that fiery furnace that they submitted themselves to what God wanted to do in their life. And it was in that fiery situation that God revealed himself and said, look who I am. Look, you look who you really are worshiping. Look who you really are serving. And the Bible says that not even a hair on their head was sins. And that which had them bound the fire set them free and they all began to worship the one true God because of the revelation of who he really was through the fire what are you saying pastor I'm saying this some of you are getting sick and tired of the fire some of you are saying God take me out of the fire but I've come to tell you start thanking God for the fire because through the fire you're really going to understand and know who he really is It's through trouble we find out who he is. It's through distress we find out who he is. And it's through the fire we really know who he is. How do you know he's your healer unless you've been sick in your body? Somebody can tell me about it, 
but unless I rub unless I've been healed of cancer or unless I've been healed of sugar diabetes or unless I've been healed of a migraine headache or unless I've been healed of a heart failure I really don't know he's a healer how do you know that God is a way maker unless you found yourself in a situation and you didn't know where to turn you didn't see any way out you didn't see a door but when God steps in and says get ready I'm about to perform something miraculous and he makes a way where there seemeth to be no way then I know he's my way maker if I've never been hungry and thirsty how do I know he's my water when I'm when I'm thirsty and he's my bread when I'm hungry it's because I know who he is through the trials and tests of my life because I know who he is because I know who he is for Daniel is deliverance from the lions and for Joshua is departing the Jordan River and crossing into the promised land for David it was when God gave him victory over Goliath and the Philistines for Paul it was being blinded and spoken to by Jesus on the Damascus road and we could go on and on and on and these defining moments forced these servants to experience something beyond their human experience it took them outside their own paradigm of life and God had to bring them outside their own box and when he did their lives were never the same I've come today to tell every individual in this house, every man in this place, every woman in this place today that it's time for you to have a defining moment in your walk with God. It's time that you have an encounter with him like you've never had before. It's time that you have an experience that will forever change who and what you are. You need to make up in your mind today, I'm not going to leave this place until I'm changed. You need to, you need to make up in your mind today that I'm not going to quit worshiping him until I'm changed. You need to make up in your mind today that I'm not going to walk away from his presence until I'm changed. I know some of you, I hear it in your spirit right now. You're tired of who you are. You're tired of what you've done. You're tired of where you're you've been uh, and you're tired of doing what you've already done uh, then I've come to tell you have an encounter with him uh, and have an experience with him uh, and have a revelation of who he really is uh, it's one thing you get in the Holy Ghost but it's another thing when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of you you want to know why some struggle all the time is because they got the Holy Ghost but the Holy Ghost never got a hold of them it's time for the Holy Ghost to get a hold of us it's time for me to make up in my mind that I am not leaving this house until there's a change in my heart and mind and spirit. You need to declare I'm tired of living in the same sin I've always been living in. And I'm tired of going through the same foolishness that I've always gone through. And I'm tired of dealing with the very same devils I've always dealt with. And I'm tired of all the very same attitudes and spirits that seem to always latch on to me. It's time for you to exercise your power in the Holy Ghost and say I need to have a fresh encounter and I need to have a fresh experience with Almighty God. I need to know him in a way I've never known him before in my life Hallelujah. that's the only way you're going to make it it's the only way you're going to make it there was a day on the road to Damascus heard along almost done where Paul understood that being a Pharisee and a son of a Pharisee wasn't enough there was a day on the road to Damascus where Paul understood that being a Hebrew of the Hebrews and the tribe of Benjamin wasn't enough there was a day on the road to Damascus where Paul understood that being a pupil of Gamaliel and being taught according to the perfect law of the fathers wasn't enough on the road to Damascus where Paul understood that being a student of Greek as well as Jewish literature wasn't enough and being groomed for the Sanhedrin and rubbing shoulders with the best of company and having the right background wasn't enough. He needed an experience with Almighty God. He had to have a defining moment in his life. It wasn't his education that got him through the beatings. It was not his knowledge of the Greek and Jewish literature that got him through the shipwrecks. Let, let me stop right here and say this. It's not enough just to know the word. Yeah. It's not a double shy. It's not enough just to quote the word. Yeah. It wasn't because he was a religious man that got him through the sufferings and trials. He was able, he was able to sane them. And he was able to overcome them. And he was able to get through them simply because he had a defining moment in his life. Uh, and an encounter with Almighty God. Uh, and an experience with God. You listen to Pastor today and I'm going to say it again. Attending church is not enough. Yes. Attending church will not get you to heaven. Being religious is not enough. Yes, yes. Believing on him is not enough. Knowing Hebrew and Greek and the word of God is not enough. 
Clapping your hands and raising your hands is not enough. It's having a Damascus experience that's going to get you through your present dilemma. It's having a Damascus experience that's going to get you through your present distress. It's having a Damascus experience that's going to get you through your pain and turmoil. It's having a Damascus experience that's going to get you through the beatings and the shipwreck. And you'll be able to reach back to that experience and that encounter you had with Almighty God and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is with me and everything is going to be all right. What it's all about. Musicians come as young, husband and father, the age of 31, suffered a great loss in his life. That story goes on to tell us that his family got in their car and left the house on a sunny Saturday morning to never return. His loving wife and two children was on their way to a birthday party for a friend of one of the children. As they were approximately two miles from their house, a large truck ran a light in a very busy intersection, T-boning them and pushing them down the street for many yards, instantly killing every single person in that car. The father, as this was happening, was leaving the house to do some errands. And as he approached the accident, something began to tell him that something was wrong. So he immediately left his car and ran to the accident. As he approached the accident, he recognized the car and he rushed over to the car and found his wife and his three-year-old, six-year-old had been killed. And as he fell to the ground in pain and in grief and sorrow, he shouted, God, I don't understand why, but you never make a mistake. You never make a mistake. What causes a man to do such a thing? What causes a man to say such a thing? What causes a man to respond in a way such as he responded? I'll tell you what it was. It was an experience that he had just Saturday morning at home in his family room by himself crying out to God seeking God and running after God and he said God I'm tired of just going through the motions God I'm tired of just feeling the way I've always felt and God I want more of you and I gotta have more of you come to find out this man had an experience a defining moment in his life and had an encounter with God that changed him forever for this man personally told me himself that he laid there for two hours that Saturday morning under the power of the Holy Ghost. And he felt a visible form walk into that room and lay its hand on his head. That was a defining moment in his life where he had a visitation from Almighty God. He had no idea what he was going to have to face just a few hours later. He had no idea what he was going to experience that sunny Saturday afternoon. He had no idea what he was going to encounter as he approached that intersection that day. But there was a moment in his family room. There was an experience. There was an encounter with God that he was able to reach back to that caused him to cry out, God, you're always faithful. And God, I don't understand. But you are a good God. Listen to me today, it wasn't a hand clap that sustained him. It wasn't a foot stomping that kept him. It wasn't shaking hands with the pastor that helped him. It wasn't a sermon or a song that met him that day in the intersection. It was an experience that he had with God by himself that even went beyond and above the power of the Holy Ghost. It was an encounter with God that he reached back to that kept him, that sustained him, that caused him to be in his right mind. Let me stop right here and say this today, that when all of hell is coming against me, why is it that I still worship? It's because I've had an encounter with God. Why is it when every devil in hell is tormenting me that I remain faithful? It's because I've had an encounter that defining moment in my life. 
when I'm facing pain and suffering and turmoil and grief and sorrow, why is it that I still trust Him? It's because I've had an experience with God. When I feel like quitting, when I feel like turning around, when I feel like I can't make it any longer, what sustains me and what keeps me? It's because I've had an experience with God. Religion only takes you so far. A hand clap will only do so much. A song on my lips will only last for a brief moment in time. But when I have an experience, when I have an encounter with Almighty God, that'll keep me. That'll sustain me when nothing else will. What are you talking about, Pastor? This is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when a day in my life when I was about 20 years old I walked into this sanctuary and I said God I need more than just the Holy Ghost and God I need more than just forgiveness of salvation and God I need more than just rather forgiveness of sins and God I need more than just a quickening in my life but God I need an experience I need an encounter of the changing kind for God, there's fear in my heart, and God, there's fear in my mind, and God, there's fear in my spirit. And God, I'm hesitant about some things, and God, I need you to reveal yourself to me in a way you've never revealed yourself to me before. That way, in those times when I need you the most, I can reach back in my life and lay hold of that encounter that I've had with you. I walked through those back doors, walked down that aisle. I couldn't even get to the front. And all I said is, God, give me that encounter with you. Immediately, by where Sister Mason's sitting, I hit the ground. And I laid there. And it felt as if the Lord Jesus Christ himself was standing right before me. It wasn't fear as being afraid that came over me. It was fear in all of knowing who was standing before me. And therefore I could not even lift my head. And before I knew it, an hour had passed, and two hours had passed, three hours passed, and four hours passed. And when I came to myself, five hours had passed. And when I arose off that floor, I felt a difference in my life. It was something that I felt beyond the Holy Ghost. It was something that I had an encounter with beyond just a normal church service. It was when I came to the Lord and said, Lord, I need you in a way I've never had you before. And I need to feel you in a way I've never felt you before. And i got to have something that I can reach back to that will keep me and sustain me when the feeling's not there. And when my faith is low, and when I'm not in church, and when all hell comes against me. I will say this today in closing that there have been times in my life that I've walked through hell and back. There's been times in my life that I didn't think that I was going to make it. Pastor, you felt that way? Oh, absolutely. I'm flesh just like you. And I battled devils and spirits just like you. There were times in my life where I felt alone, felt despondent, and a heart that was dismayed. And there's been times in my life where I was overwhelmed by the things of life and trials and tests. But you know the thing that got me through was that experience I shared with you that I had with God that I could reach back to and it kept me and it preserved me and it sustained me 
Once you experience God in His glory, you can't turn away from Him. And you can never, ever forget His touch. It's not an argument. It's not a doctrine. It's not a belief. And it's not a theology. It's an encounter and an experience. I don't know to you today, but I don't want an argument. I want an experience. I don't want just a doctrine. I want an experience encounter with Almighty God. I don't want just a belief system. I want an experience and encounter with Almighty God. An experience will change me from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. An encounter with God will do for me what other things could not do for me. As you stand to your feet today, let me share one more thing with you. No one exiting the building. How could this man in Acts chapter 7 and verse 57 stand by and promote and encourage what happened on that day as he was visiting the stoning of Stephen? For it says... At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him in out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of the young man named Saul while they received my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep dead. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. We find in Acts chapter 8 that he began to destroy the church going from house to house dragging off men and women and putting them into prison but then we find this same man around the date of AD 64 where persecutions were stirred up by Nero and we find that Nero's rage against the Christians were so fierce that Eusebius records a man might then see cities full of men's bodies the old lying together with the young and the dead bodies of women cast out naked without reverence of that sex in the open streets. And we find that as we study the persecution that Paul also suffered under his persecution when Nero sent two of his inquirers and Phrygia and Parthemius to bring him to his execution. And they found Paul instructing the people and asked him to pray for them so they might believe. And receiving Paul's assurance that they would soon be baptized the two men led him out of the city to the place of execution where Paul was beheaded. And as he laid there, history tells us that he cried out, and I quote, I once fought against him, but I now stand with him, and I will never turn my back on him. What he was saying is, I once fought against the Lord. But now I stand with the Lord. And I will never turn my back on the Lord. What was it that caused him to say that? At the moment of beheading, he reached back to the road of Damascus and said, Lord, you've kept me. Lord, you've helped me. And at my moment of death, I know that I will see you in a way. Come to tell somebody you've been through it. And you're going through it. You're fighting every spirit no one demand. And there's things hounding you. Like a manging dog nipping at your heels. But I've come to tell you today that you can have an encounter with God that'll bring you through. You can have an encounter with God that'll sustain you and keep you, that'll go beyond anything you've ever experienced before in your life. Here's what we want to do today in the presence of the Lord. I want you to take the hand of the neighbor you're standing beside right now. I want you to take that hand of the neighbor right now in the name of the Lord. God desires 
to give somebody an encounter in this place right now. God desires to change somebody right now from the top of their head to the sole of their feet. God right now desires to give you an experience like you've never had before in all of your life. And if you'll receive what God has for you now, it's going to sustain you and it's going to keep you. And you're going to have a true understanding and revelation of who he really is. I want you to throw that hand to the air right now that you're holding the hand of right now. And every man and every woman and every boy and girl and every guest, I want you to raise your voice now and I want you to begin to pray in the Holy Ghost all across this building. Come on, some of you feel like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you're facing a fiery furnace. Come on, some of you feel like a Daniel, and you're standing in the midst of a lion's den. Come on, some of you feel like a David, and you're facing a Goliath, and it's bigger than you've ever seen before in all your life. Yes, God's given you victory of the lion and the bear, but now you're looking at a Goliath, and he's calling your name, and he's haunting you, and he's, he's taunting you, and, it, and now you've got to lean on God. Come on, some of you, you're experiencing what Joseph experienced. You found yourself in a prison. But God's given you promises and God's given you visions. And God has given you understanding. But yet now you found yourself in a prison. But God is about to bring you through right now. It's an encounter that you can have with God that will bring you through. That's it. Raise your voice now in the name of the Lord. Raise your voice now in the name of the Lord. Come on. God's about to give you a burning bush experience. Come on. God's about to give you a Peter experience where it's walking on the water, walking on your situation, walking on that storm, walking in the midst of the storm and him leading and guiding you by his very hand. If God did it for them, he'll do it for you. I've come to tell everybody today, if you'll just put your faith and trust in God and know that he's with you, He's going to be there for you. Everything's going to be all right. He's going to bring you through. He's going to bring you through. He's going to bring you through. Let that encounter help you. Let that encounter sustain you. Let that encounter keep you today. That's it, let him visit you this hour I'm talking about more than just the Holy Ghost I'm talking about a revelation of who he really is I'm talking about an encounter of the changing kind I'm talking about something being birthed on inside of you That's never been birthed before I'm talking about a transformation of the heart and mind and spirit I'm talking about an unction that's resting upon you now